welcome to our Historical Society program. I'm Kathy Cavallari. I'm president of the Westboro Historical Society. Uh, we're happy you've joined us this evening. Uh, the Historical Society was founded in 1889 to preserve local history through research programs and the preservation of artifacts. And our headquarters is at the Sibley House, an 1844 Greek Revival home built by slaymaker William Sibley uh, that's located at 13 Parkman Street in Westboro, right up from the library. And for more than a century, the Society's mission has been to celebrate local history and bring that history to life through our monthly presentations, like this one, uh, Sibley House tours, which we hope to you know, offer again in the spring, and special events. And if you enjoyed tonight's program, we encourage you to like our Facebook page, which is Westboro Historical Society, and check out our website, uh, www.westborohistory.org. And we have membership forms here tonight, um, and you can also become a member through the website. So our, um, our speaker tonight is Mr. Andrew Noon. Um, Andrew is a Worcester native and a professional musician who has served as a church organist and music director. He's taught music at Belmont Street Elementary School for 15 years and has served as a music specialist for the Worcester Public Schools for 21 years. And he's you know, close to retiring, but still working. Uh, he has a degree in music as well as graduate degrees in musicology and art history from Syracuse University. He's also a watercolor artist, so he's a bit of a renaissance man. <laughs> Uh, he's a former member of the Worcester Historical Commission and is a docent with Preservation Worcester. Um, and Mr. Noon lives in a house opposite Green Hill Park, which is the site of the unmarked grave of Bathsheba Spooner. And shortly after he moved into the home, a visiting friend told him Bathsheba's story, and he was intrigued and soon off to the races researching it. Uh, so this is his first book. It was self-published this past February after several years of research, including many hours spent researching at the American Antiquarian Society. And he has also completed the three-year Keepers of the Republic program for teacher development that's hosted by the American Antiquarian Society. Um, so Mr. Noon has turned this astonishing tale into both a scholarly narrative and a page-turner that reads like a novel. A reviewer described it as, quote, a tragedy at the intersection of true crime and history. Be and beyond central Massachusetts, the tale has been largely unknown until now. Uh, so his book, I would say, has revived this notorious piece of history in a well-researched and gripping tale. I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Andrew Noon. My thanks to, uh, my thanks to Kathy and the Westboro, Histor Westboro Historical Society. Um, I think I'll start with uh, a synopsis and then move on to uh, favorite questions people ask me and address those. Uh, then a little bit about um, Ebenezer Parkman, who's the Westboro star in the story. <laughs> then I'll read uh, two, actually two readings from the book and then conclude with your questions. So the synopsis, um, Bathsheba Spooner was the uh, next to last of um, seven children born to Timothy Ruggles and Bathsheba born Newcomb. Mrs. Ruggles had birthed eight children from her first marriage. Her mother's roots were firmly planted in one of Hi. Cod's oldest families. Her father's from Roxbury. Timothy was born in 1711. In 1711, a descendant of a family long involved in Massachusetts politics, but none enjoyed the status to which he would rise. A brigadier general in the French and Indian War, he had also served as Speaker of the House for two years. His reputation suffered dramatically when, as delegate to the Stamp Act Congress of 1765 in New York, he refused to join those protesting the actions of Parliament and King George III. Now firmly placed in the camp of those loyal to the king, he freely accepted the position of Mandamus Counselor, one of the men who were appointed by the king's governor to the upper Massachusetts House to do the king's bidding. Few men were as loathed in Massachusetts in the year 1774. That year, um, he was banished from his new hometown of Hardwick, a town his ancestors had founded and he himself nurtured. He remained in British-controlled Boston until evacuation day, March 17, 1776, when he was removed with most Tories to Staten Island. This is uh, the Congregational Church in, I'm not sure if this is his church, most likely is in Hardwick. If this is not the original church, the original church would be within this.
In the meantime, daughter Bathsheba had married Joshua Spooner of Boston, um, a businessman slash land speculator slash lumber salesman. The couple settled in Brookfield, not far from nearby Hardwick. The marriage may have been an arranged one, a marriage which gossipers usually characterized as inharmonious. Sixteen-year-old uh, militiaman Ezra Ross of Topsfield, a native of Ipswich, left his hospital camp in 1777 in Peekskill, New York, to venture home. En route, he was taken in by Bathsheba in Brookfield and nursed back to health. He returned to Topsfield, then headed west again that fall to join uh, what would become the Battle of Saratoga. The British had hoped to cut New England off from the remaining nine colonies. General Burgoyne's troops heading south to meet up with General Howe's troops heading north. It was not to be. Howe instead focused on Philadelphia, leaving Burgoyne to fend off the increasing masses of American troops north of Albany. His entire army surrendered to American General Gates. March to Saratoga, Battlefield. Uh, March to Boston, the British POWs were quartered in Cambridge and Charleston, Charlestown rather. Both uh, Sergeant James Buchanan and Private William Brooks uh, managed to escape, not a difficult task and likely met each other in Worcester for the first time. Now February 1778, the men were apparently headed to Springfield to work when during a fierce snowstorm, they were called in to the Spooner home. They remained there for the next few weeks, Bathsheba plotting her husband's murder with them. In the meantime, young Ezra Ross, just having attempted to poison Mr. Spooner, left with him to prepare Spooner's Princeton property, soon to be hand handed over to Spooner's brother. Ross never made it to Princeton, apparently borrowing Spooner's horse to return to Topsfield. So this is a, a slide of East um, Princeton. East Princeton, um, a portion of it was part of Sterling uh, back in the 1760s um, when it became actually the town of Sterling. So it's kind of, East Princeton's, again, border Sterling. And the question is, we're not sure if any of, the, any of this acreage may have been the acreage owned by uh, Spooner, very possible. All rendezvous in Brookfield the, the evening of March 1st, 1778, it is unclear if the meeting was coincidental or arranged. Having um, dined with a friend and his wife, Joshua returned home alone through the snow and was assaulted at his well, beaten to death, and thrown in while his wife finished eating her dinner. <laughs> the clothes he wore and those from his uh, chamber, along with his cash, were distributed among the three men who fled on horseback and foot. All were arrested the next day. The trial took place in late April. Abraham Lincoln's distant cousin, Levi, as Attorney General. Here's the Worcester County Courthouse. Um, this is the only build, building extant from the time. Uh, it's on Massachusetts Ave, now in Worcester. Originally, it was at Lincoln Square, about, you know, say, a mile and a quarter south of this. In the 1870s, I believe, it was moved to Trumbull Square, which is where the library is. It was dismantled in 1900, 1899 and moved to Mass Ave. Mass Ave was a new district being developed by Stephen Salisbury. This was the first home in the district that was, so it was moved in. It wasn't the first home built, obviously. They disassembled it from downtown Worcester, reassembled it here, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so as a side note, this is probably Worcester's most historic property. Not only did the indictment of Bathsheba take place here, but also Shays Rebellion, which was one of the scenes of Shays Rebellion in 1788. Uh, it was also the scene of the um, final court case which ended slavery in Massachusetts. <laughs> So it took place in late April. Okay. Uh, Robert Treat Payne, uh, a sign of the declaration, was a prosecutor. So this is, there's Levi Lincoln, the older portrait, obviously. He later became Thomas Jefferson's attorney general. A new one. Give me one second. A new one filed here. Um, that's Robert Tree Payne, again, a sign of the declaration. Uh, with a trial lasting just over a day plus, uh, trials in the 18th century were very fast, unlike today. All were found guilty. Um, the date of execution was originally set for early June, but the four received a stay until July 2nd. Bathsheba claimed pregnancy. The officials in Boston allowed an exam to be done, proving that she was not with the child. She insisted. Uh, a second exam not authorized, instead confirmed her pregnancy, but the Boston authorities would not relent. Despite an informal third exam proving her right, her execution date was not changed. On June 10th, Abigail Adams wrote to her son John Quincy, 
with his father in Paris. The modern history of our own times furnishes as black a list of crimes as can be paralleled in ancient time, even if going back to Nero, Caligula, or Cesare Borgia. And I have, I have no doubt in my mind that she was referring to this case. This was all in the newspapers throughout Massachusetts, and there was nothing like this occurring at the time, certainly. Uh, this is maybe five years before she wrote the letter. Um, all four accomplices uh, were hanged on July 2nd. An autopsy requested by Bathsheba confirmed her pregnancy of five months with a male child. This is Union Station in Worcester, uh, 1912. Uh, most likely, uh, this is the um, Gallo site. Okay, uh, so it's just outside of downtown. So you're literally, you're literally a thousand feet east of downtown. Uh, the other possibility is uh, Worcester's main post office, which is uh, third. Meh. Give me a third mile down the street on the left hand side. So, but most likely this was the site of the executions. Um, Timothy Ruggles eventually found his way to Nova Scotia, where, as a loyal servant to the Crown, he was granted a multi hundred acre estate, which he fostered as he had his legendary estate in Hardwick. His wife chose to stay behind in Massachusetts with their son. Timothy died in 1795 and was buried near his home in Nova Scotia. Uh, to this day, the burial site in Greenhill Park of Bathsheba and her unborn son has never been located. It remains Worcester County's favorite mystery. Here's Greenhill Park. This is a um, really 20th century postcard. Um, the, to my back is where the um, family estate, the Green estate was. So her, uh, John Green, was the best known doctor in Massachusetts at the time. His wife was Bathsheba's favorite sister. So she often visited this, um, this, this park, uh, this estate. Uh, again, many suggestions have been made where she may be buried. Uh, over here is the new Vietnam, the new 20 year old Vietnam, state mm -hmm. Vietnam Memorial. Mm -hmm. Some suggested she was buried behind there. Mm -hmm. uh, others have said the golf course. The problem with the golf course is that most likely the Greens in the 18th century did not own all this property. They kept adding parcels over the centuries. So I don't think they would have owned the, the, um, where the golf course is, that parcel. Mm -hmm. Also, keep in mind it was, it was literally 95 degrees that day. They were transporting a body in that heat with crowds all around them, up a hill. Are you going to add another mile to bury your body? Not very likely. Um, and it's, we don't know how many people followed her to what distance, followed the entourage to what distance. But no one's ever found a marker. It's been suggested maybe, where, again, where I am, the home is right here, in front of the house. No one knows. And the question is also, if you were burying your favorite sister, would you, out of sight, out of mind, or would you want her within view? You know, it's hard to say. Um, but obviously they had to bury where no publicity, no um, curiosity secrets would find her. Um, a few questions. Um, what inspired you to write this book? When my family bought our first home across the street from Green Hill Park, a friend came by for dinner a few weeks later. He reminded me of the infamous tale of Bathsheba Spooner a lifelong de devotee of Worcester's history, especially as a village during the Revolution, I wanted to learn more. This being the late um, 1990s, besides a mid-19th century essay and the odd article or two, no full-scale study had ever been done. I decided that my first book would tackle the notorious episode. While in the middle of research, and with the book about one-third written, Deborah Navis's book appeared in 1999. Well written and scholarly, I admired her contribution, yet I still hungered for a less academic approach one which would comprehensively relate the details of the case. While nonfiction, I wanted to tell the story more like a novel. And I wanted to do more than just relate a true-to-life melodrama. Since the early 19th century, historians, poets, and other writers from eastern Massachusetts have been Boston-centric in their retelling of the colony's role in the Revolution, to the neglect of many other towns. Worcester's contribution to the conflict and the events leading up to the opening gunshot looms dramatically larger than the mere 1800 residents of 1778. I chose the tale of Bathsheba and her murderous lovers as the frame upon which to reconstruct Worcester's significant role in the rebellion. How did her father's notoriety contribute to Mrs. Spooner's downfall? Brigadier General Timothy Ruggles, legendary attorney, judge, hero of the French and Indian War, and speaker of the Massachusetts House, in 1765 made clear his devotion to the king when refusing to vote, uh, along, or rather to vote along with the colony's delegation to New York in condemning the newly imposed stamp tax. Along with Governor Hutchinson, Ruggles became regarded as the Bay Colony's most notorious loyalist. 
next to youngest Bathsheba, had apparently always been uh, his favorite child. Now married to Bostonian Joshua Spooner in Brookfield, her isolation from her father several miles distant, and nearly 70 miles from the colony's capital, likely only distrust a dynamic, erratic personality such as hers. Her father's removal to Staten Island, of course, only worsened the situation, further exacerbated by her own loyalist stance. Was Bathsheba insane? Playing armchair psychologist from nearly two and a half centuries away is tenuous for a professional, for me impossible. We can only speculate, and the facts might lend themselves to characterizing Miss Spooner as imbalanced. She had a sharp temper and was involved sexually with at least two, and more likely five men, none of whom were her husband. She freely welcomed two enemy POWs into her home, and on occasion, a handsome teenager, in her husband's presence. Her actions were often erratic. She allowed her two-year-old daughter to touch her husband's corpse. She jeopardized the future lives of her three surviving children. She lied incessantly. Would we be safe in assuming that she at least exhibited signs of a disordered personality? Although her attorney suggested insanity during the trial, it would take many more decades before such a defense would be admissible in a court of law. Was teenager Ezra Ross truly guilty, and of what? This is one of the hardest to answer, and the overall situation perhaps the most poignant of the saga. Age-wise, the 18th century freely condemned teenagers, but what exactly was uh, his role? It appeared that he had no knowledge of the murderous March 1st plot before that date. He had spent many days before at his Tossfield home. Had Bathsheba sent him any letters while there? Given the slow pace of mail, it's unlikely. He turned up in Brookfield only hours before the murder, which uh, he did discuss with the two British men in Bathsheba. And keeping in mind that weeks earlier he had tried to poison Spooner and had planned to try again before leaving for Topsfield, his background certainly did not incline the jury to consider his role more leniently. Just a little side note on uh, Parkman, uh, 1703 to 1782, he was pastor of the West Church in uh, Westboro from the age of 21 until his death. He produced a huge volume of letters and sermons. His diary might be the most complete by that of any 18th century minister from the Northeast. One historian wrote, his diary is a record of the social history of Massachusetts, provincial life, nowhere equal for length, for completeness, or for sustained interest. The Westboro Historical Society, of course, has recently, um, along with the American Antiquarian Society, completed uh, an edition of his writings. Ebenezer was the son of William Parkman and Elizabeth Adams Parkman of Boston. He entered Harvard at age 14 and graduated in 1724. Uh, that year, he began his pastorate in Westboro and married Mary Champney in Cambridge. He married his second wife, Hannah, Hannah Breck, in 1737. His home was located where the Lyman School now stands. He fathered two children from his first marriage and 11 more with Hannah. He's buried in the town's memorial cemetery. His epitaph reads, He was a learned, pious, good man and full of the Holy Spirit and faith unfeigned and answered St. Paul's description of a scripture bishop, being blameless, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, and to teach, I'm sorry, apt to teach. Parkman tracked the Spooner saga closely. Present at the indictments, he referred to Bathsheba as the dux femina facti, or the female instigator of the deed. At the trial three days later, he wrote, a great throng, a most sad sight. The next day, he entered in his diary, the awful and shocking sentence of death was pronounced. Mrs. Spooner, near the end of her jail stay, tried to convince Parkman that it was young Ezra Ross who served as murderous kingpin. Ross later told him of Bathsheba's inviting him to defile her marriage bed. After that, she proposed constantly every scheme for her husband's death. Parkman was asked to deliver a sermon in Worcester a few days later. When he reflected upon the adulteress, how can we conceive of one who shall be so metamorphosed or changed into such a monster? An interesting side note, Ebenezer's 12th child, Samuel, at age 50, commissioned the bell for the meeting house. Paul Revere fashioned it at a cost of $389.33. A new steeple was built to accommodate the bell. Over the years, it was moved to various locations. The legendary hurricane of 1938 blew both bell and steeple from the First Baptist Church into the cemetery across the road. In 2011, the bell was purchased by the Old North Church in Boston to hang in the steeple from which Paul Revere was alerted on April 18, 1775, to begin his ride. It was the first bell to, first bell to hang in the church since the 1870s. Any questions? Mm -hmm. I have a sure. question. 
that she so she was executed, and then it was discovered that she was pregnant, and right. then she so she was the first woman executed in, in the United States. In the United States, right. and then after she was executed, and after people realized that she was a child, there were no more there were no more executions in Worcester. Uh, yes, there were. Oh, okay. So yeah, no more women were executed. Uh, following Bathsheba, I believe there were. No, there were none. No, okay. there were. Uh, come, come, came close. But okay. no one goes, yeah. There were no further executions. No. In fact, a woman in, I want to say Salem, by legal maneuvering, avoided execution. But that was the closest when it came. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in Worcester, Worcester, Worcester no. no, no. There were executions in Worcester after men, but no women as far as I know. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Sure. Are there any written accounts of the trial on, like, court records? Oh, that's, or my book is based on that. Uh, the court records are probably the most complete of the 18th century in America. So, um, Judge. Um, Jedediah Foster Brookfield took elaborate notes. So did really she, did she have a, an attorney representative or her sister? Yeah, uh, she had, her attorney was Levi, uh, Levi Lincoln. Was Levi. He represented all of them, and then the prosecutor was paid. Sure. What uh, religious congregation did she belong to? Her father was um, uh, a congregationalist, which was unusual for um, loyalists. Most loyalists were Anglican. He was congregational. I, I imagine she was, although there's no mention of her attending anywhere. but. I don't know. She was too good. She had other activities. You'd expect there'd be some influence, apparently. Yeah, you would think, but <laughs> she was a very independent, uh, typical 18th century woman. Nothing, nothing typical about you. Sure. Do, do we know what happened to her children? Uh, like kids one, uh, I believe, died in shipwreck off England. Another became a Boston businessman. And the daughter who touched the corpse, and the 19th century makes reference to a, a writer saying that she died insane. But what does that mean in the 19th century? Was she, did she have Alzheimer's? You know, uh, we, we don't know what that meant. It's, it, the phrase was hopelessly insane, interpret that as you will. I'm interested in this idea that touching a corpse was so abhorrent, right. you know? I mean, people kiss the corpses of their parents now and all of that, nobody pays right. any attention. It's, it's just no one else it, her other children would not go near it. But it you don't see a feeling like she, like she led the child there, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But it was, this was also a touch by, um, a reference in the book, uh, it was believed that, certainly through the 17th century, that if you uh, touch the corpse, if a red mark was shown, you're guilty. Mm -hmm. um, so it may be that a legend may have been in its last breath. They were using that, that legend, maybe, as the, instead of having a child touch it instead. But again, that was that's a seventeenth century practice, lingering into the eighteenth. Sure. Where can you find Joshua Spooner's grave? He's in the uh, Brookfield Cemetery, so a quarter, uh, third of a mile to the um, uh, west of the other road there. Home. And is there any place where there's any remnants of the well? Yeah, all that's left is a, um, a stone circle with a slab. Mm -hmm. And what's strange is it's about this big. I understand 18th century people were smaller, <laughs> but how do you, in the snow, how do you possibly force someone? I was getting the feeling you go test, but they had to break bones. I don't know. How do we force them into that tiny? Unless over the centuries, it, or rather earlier, had been bigger, and somehow that makes no sense because it's a stone ring around it. Is this is that the picture on your book? Uh, no, this is a Russian well. I, I oh, chose okay. a dramatic photo. So, <laughs> uh, this is, I mean, this is probably typically 18th century well, but um. And obviously, all, all this left today is just this at the very bottom. But this is how it may have appeared. Sure. Do we know who was the father of the unborn child? No, most likely Ezra Ross. That's always been suggested. Probably was him. Uh, the mystery is what did they do with his body? He was from Topsfield, so it's 95 degrees. Uh, the transport of bodies in um, formaldehyde didn't start until the Civil War. So, what did they do with the body in mystery? He's buried in Topsfield. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. They couldn't have put him on ice. The ice would be gone in 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. Very strange. I mean, again, a cart ride would have taken literally 12 hours. And minimally, maybe 15 hours by cart. So, yeah, couldn't, that wouldn't have worked out. Is it true there were like 5,000 people in Worcester watching? Right. The so, there were 1,800 up in, the, up in the town and 5,000 showed up. Wow. So, it was okay. an incredible crowd. There were only 1,800 people living in Worcester? Worcester. Yeah. Worcester yeah. was a village. Yeah. Wow. Most of it didn't start booming until the, um, the Blackstone Canal in the 1830s. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. Sure. The uh, painting of Bathsheba that hung in the courthouse, right. 
I've always been fascinated. Sante Graziani was a, um, a, a, a painter instructor at the Worcester Art Museum. What was the name? Sante Graziani. And when did he paint that? Uh, the 70s, I believe, late 70s, I think. Uh, it's very fanciful. He paints her as she would appear in the 17th century. Also, he paints her as kind of a, a working class woman. That she would never dress like that. Uh, also, she had a plume, this, a very fanciful white plume in her hair at the executions, as it would be. Um, so, yeah, she looks as she would a century earlier. I think you said that they were caught very quickly uh, right. in the trial. Right. What was their did they what was their plan to get away with this? There was no plan. It was really Keystone cops. Um, the next day they were in Worcester Tavern and the clothes they had stolen from Joshua. Uh, William Brooks, the actual murderer, is stretching his legs out of the tavern and he's wearing Joshua Spooner's buckles, JS <laughs> silver buckles. And the crowd was horrified. <clears throat> It, Bathsheba was arrested uh, that morning, mm -hmm. so she was taken from Brookfield. And Ezra Ross, I don't know who he was, but he was, he was arrested the same day. With that. Were arranged marriages common in that time? Oh, sure. Yeah. They're very common. So the Spooners would have worked. If they were the same family, they were a well off family, business family. So it doesn't sound like love at first sight by any stretch. Mm -hmm. Also, um, Spooner, Joshua Spooner is always uh, depicted as being very cranky. But that's not really fair because every time we run across Joshua Spooner, someone's doing something obnoxious to him, either <laughs> stealing things from him or invading his house or about to kill him or poisoning him. I mean, how would you react? <laughs> so there were no happy scenes with Joshua, which I expect to be the case. Yeah. But he had friends. Oh, he had several friends, friends in Brookfield. Right? He seemed young. He, he, he's having dinner before. Uh, several friends had been at his house earlier. Um, yeah. So. Was divorce uh, acceptable then? Again, sh um, yeah, she would have gotten only one third of the estate at best oh. had they been divorced. Also, divorce would have you know, uh, painted the family's name forever right. at that point. Uh, it also, her father would have spoken against divorce, being as prominent as he was. He would have been in favor of them. Also, divorce would have exposed an awful lot of laundry. <laughs> they didn't want to go in that direction. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, are, you, yeah. are you willing to sign? Oh, I'll sign. Sure.